Hello. So yeah, my name's Adam Norman. Um, so for the past probably five years or so, I've been working on a PhD project with both the University of Adelaide and Australian Grain Technologies on genomic selection. So it's basically just a new technology available for wheat breeders um, or all plant breeding. So and in the past two years, I've uh, started working with AGT, partly as a wheat breeder, but also uh, deploying this technology. So it's been pretty exciting for me to work on a project which is looking at a specific technology and then also follow that through um, into the industry. So to kick things off, just going to go pretty high level today. Um, I'm going to start off by just talking about what a wheat breeding program looks like. So at the beginning, we start out with new breeding lines. So to do this, make a cross between two elite cultivars uh, and then let sort of nature take its course. So there's random genetic recombination and that produces genetic combinations in new breeding lines that we've never seen before. So we've got no control over that process and because of that, we need to make a lot of these combinations in order to have a chance of producing what we want. So we make a lot of them, there might be 20 or 30,000 of them at the start of a program, and then move into a, a process of evaluation and selection. And this takes a couple of years, partly because we're testing things in the field, so there's seasonal conditions, genotype by environment interactions, so things don't always perform the same one year to the next, so you need to do it over a long period of time. Uh, but also just to be able to test the number of traits that we're looking at, so something like end use quality, it's very expensive to test. It costs around $300 per line. So you're not going to do that at the start on all 30,000 or 20,000. You're going to wait until right down the bottom where you've got only a couple hundred. So at each stage of selection, we sort of cull it down, narrow down the process, and continue on. And then hopefully at the end of it, we've got a variety which we can release, which is hopefully better than the things that went in at the start. So we think about what information we're basing this decisions, these decisions on. In this evaluation and selection process, so this whole step here, we've got largely field trials is what we're basing that information on. But at the top, we've got no information. So when we make a new breeding line, that genetic combination has never been seen before, so we know nothing about it. Uh, so we need to take all of them into the breeding program. And if we think about uh, putting resources into something based on a decision that we make. I think if we're making a decision based on good, solid information, then we could say that's an investment that we're making. But if we're making a decision based on poor information or no information, then that's more of a gamble. So filling this information hole up here is sort of where my project came into it and looking at genomic selection. Now, genomic selection is a pretty complex uh, topic, and it's extremely boring if I went into the nuts and bolts of it. So given that I've already raised the topic of gambling, and given that we're right next to the casino, and maybe a few of us may or may not end up at the casino later on tonight, for the rest of the talk, I'm pretty much going to talk about plant breeding as a roulette table. So if we picture this roulette wheel as those new breeding lines at the start of a program, which we know nothing about, and if we want to decide whether to take them to the field to evaluate them, in conventional plant breeding, we have to place a bet on every single one of those lines. And we know plant breeding, like roulette, is a pretty low odds game, so there's only one winner, which means there's many wasted bets, and that's, that's the name of the game. So what can we do about that? So to improve the odds, probably 30 or 40, 40 years ago, uh, plant breeders and pre-breeders looked at DNA markers, which was an emerging technology at the time, as a way uh, to sort of skew the odds a bit. So these have been really useful and applied for over 20 years in plant breeding, but only for like simple, simple genetic traits, so something like disease resistance, where you can get one gene and completely change things. So let's look at how that changes the equation. If we use a genetic marker to identify four lines which aren't good options, so we just don't place a bet on those, uh, and then we see which one wins, and we haven't wasted a bit of money. But it's still not that great, right? You're not going to go and do that at the casino tonight, I hope. So 
This sort of brings us to genomic selection as a way we can use DNA markers to improve the odds a bit further. So as much of a definition of genomic selection as I'm, as I'm going to give today is just that it's a technology where we can use the full genomic profile to predict the performance of new breeding lines. So you can take a line which has never been grown in the field before and look at its genotype, use tens of thousands of markers across the whole genome and predict how, how good it's going to be. So we look back at our roulette table now and we use genomic prediction to predict a couple of likely winners. So these are the good ones, we think. And then we can rearrange our bets a bit more aggressively um, and see which one wins. And looky, looky. So if we could all gamble like that, uh, we'll have much better odds. And we'd probably end up something like that guy, I guess. He actually looks a little bit like a creepy version of me. I didn't. I didn't notice that yesterday when I was putting this together. <laughs> anyway, so onto my, my PhD study. So to get these prediction models off the ground, you need a lot of data. Um, and that's sort of what my PhD project was looking at. So in 2014, which is a long time ago, ago now, that's how long I've been studying, um, I ran a trial at Roseworthy with 11,000 uh, field plots. And I looked at 15 traits. So the idea of those traits was to just get different traits that had different genetic control. So we wanted to capture things that had complex uh, genetics like grain yield, but also those simple things that single markers could do well, so things like uh, disease. So most of these were just phenotypic observations that have walked past the plot and had a look. So over the course of the season, I walked about 200 k's. Uh, 35 k's of that was carrying a big grain seeker, which was not a fun way to spend a couple days. Um, and we generated about 200 million DNA data points. So from all that information, we tied it together, put it through some complex like mixed linear models to generate those uh, prediction models. And you tie those, those DNA data points together with the phenotype scores, what we're actually observing in the field. And we basically showed that, yes, this technology could work. And we learned a lot about how it could best be used and some scenarios where it perhaps didn't work as well. So off the back of that, AGT have been uh, looking pretty heavily at investing in that, and that's sort of where my job came in and uh, what we're doing at AGT now. So over the past probably four years since we started this, we've generated that high-density dense, high uh, genetic um, marker data on 230,000 breeding lines across the company, just in wheat. There's probably another 40 or 50,000 in the other crops. And we've got prediction models up and running for 30 traits. So right through from grain yield to agronomic traits, um, yeah, sprouting, all of that, and then end use quality traits as well. So the data behind those prediction models is 2 million phenotype data points, which is a crap load of data. Like, I know the next point says 4 billion DNA data points, but I'm honestly more impressed by the 2 million phenotype data points. Because the data, or the, how well these prediction models work, is only as good as that phenotype data going in. So we need a lot of high quality data going in. And basically, once you get to that amount of data, you can afford to be really strict on the quality of data that you're putting in. So if there was something, a trial which was slightly frosted or a little bit damaged, you can afford to not have it in because it's compromising the end result. So I think it's fair to say now, like of the way um, we're breeding, particularly in the early generation, this technology is completely change the way we're, we're looking at things. Um, so to tie it back to where I started on the plant breeding diagram, we have this information hole here, and we were sort of taking a gamble on lines coming into the breeding program. But now, with genomic selection, we've got some good information uh, to base our decisions on, and we're moving from gambling to actually investing in breeding lines. So thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge PhD supervisors. So from AGT, I had Hayden Cookle and James Edwards and Julian Taylor from the university. We had some collaborators from the University of Wollongong as well, as well as uh, funding from the ARC and JDC. So thanks. Please join me in thanking Adam.